first year, everybody thought we were kind of crazy. Um, I think that's the same thing that one of our panelists, Paul Stubblebine, ran into when he started the tape project. Everybody said, what are you, crazy? And 10 years later, tape is going strong. You'll see in a slide in a second or two, there's now 23 companies that are releasing music on reel-to-reel -reel tape. And that's pretty amazing given digital was released in 1980 and analog was kind of prematurely pronounced dead on arrival. So before, so not to waste any time. So quickly, we're gonna go over a couple things today. I'm Miles Astor, I'm with Positive Feedback, and also I've started my own sort of bulletin board called Audio Nirvana, and if guys wanna to go to it, we actually have a lot of tape discussion going on there, and also if people wanna to go to thetapeproject.com, that's another great resource for any questions that people have on reel-to-reel -reel tape. So basically, we have an outstanding panel. In fact, just I can't believe the panel that Chad worked so hard to put together this year. We've got Chad, who's going to make an announcement today about his jumping into making reel-to-reel -reel tape. Dan Lavery, who's the technical services director from ATR Services, and he's the guy that really works to keep all those ATR 102s in the studios running. And you know, the whole group there has always been a great resource to the tape area. Uh, Chris Mara, who's owner of Welcome to 1979 Studios in Nashville. Also Mara Machines that restores machines. Um, and finally, Paul Stubblebein. And Paul's part of the group at the Tape Project. Paul, Dan Schmally, and Mike Romanowski, who basically gave birth to tape again. They basically were the guys who started the whole tape renaissance now 10 years ago. So I think we should just give Paul and his group a hand because they really are the people that started it all. You know, everybody kind of looked at them and thought they were insane. And, you know, to give you a short story, I had two people over my place this month, played tape for them. Within two weeks, both of them bought tape decks. They just walked in. One of them had, uh, I won't mention the name, but a very expensive $40,000 DAC. And after the first cut, he looks, digital will never, ever do this. And uh, so, again, great panel. And uh, on, the, on the left, that's a picture from Rocky Mountain a couple years ago of Paul and his partner Dan enjoying themselves in their room that year. And on the right is uh, Mike Spitz. I just put Mike on there because he and Mike has that very famous phrase, uh, nothing sounds like tape. And that's kind of, again, once you hear tape, it's really the truest thing. It's kind of like once you heard tape, there's no going back. If you, you, know, you just don't want to listen to anything else after listening to tape. And today, you know, we're going to get into a couple things, you know. How many people here are, actually have a reel-to-reel -reel machine? Just raise your hands. Good, so we got a lot of tape heads. How many people here don't have a machine? Are you all here kind of get some information on how maybe to get started in listening to reel-to-reel, -reel, get your own machine? So we're going to have Chris is definitely going to talk a bit about it, and Dan about it. It's not as hard. It's pretty daunting. I remember when I thought about it, I was on the fence for years, like, should I get a tape machine, shouldn't I? There wasn't the software, and all of a sudden, then the tape project came out, now here's the software. How do I get a machine? Well, it seems really daunting, but you know what? It's no more difficult than having a turntable. In fact, it's probably less difficult, you know, running it than having a turntable. Certainly, you don't got to replace a cartridge every year, you know? That's kind of nice about it. So, again, which direction do you want to go? A prosumer machine, kind of like a Techniques or an Otari? Do you want to go to, like, a professional machine, like a Studer or the ATR on your left, okay? Or do you want to go a turnkey approach, like Greg Barron's United Home Audio Machines, where he's basically, the only thing really that he's using from an old Tascam deck is the frame. I mean, everything else in it is totally new. He's just, you know, it's totally gutted, and it's, you know, totally all-out effort. Um, and I always do this each year, and each year it's been growing. One year it just had one. Now you can see this is the number of companies that now have tape available. And it's a pretty amazing list. And what I did was put a little musical note next to a couple of the companies whose releases are particularly outstanding. For instance, uh, Groove Note, which is Ying Tan's label, they've been releasing it. Um, Horch House, which is in Europe, they've been releasing some of the Oscar Peterson and some other things. Jonathan Horwich, who's here in the Magico room, is doing his own jazz releases, or, or as long as some of reissuing some stuff that he's done in the 60s. Open Real Records from Italy, great music. Opus 3, everybody knows Opus 3. They might be among the best tapes that you'll ever hear, certainly when it comes to transparency, 
you know, and just the realness of sound with the miking technique that Jan Eric used, they're sensational. The tape project they've got, what do you guys got, 30 tapes out now, just about 30? Close. Yeah. 28, I think. Yeah, and, you know, they're all great titles. And one company that's really come on the scene that I really recommend, if you love classical music, and this guy is doing some of the best recordings, even if you don't have tape, they're on LP, they're on Quad DSD, they're on DSD's Yarlung Records. Their tapes are phenomenal. I mean, I, and you know, unfortunately, the only thing I wish he would do, the whole recording on two reels right now, he's just taking excerpts and putting it onto one reel. One of these days, maybe we can talk Bob into releasing the whole thing, because it's just so good when you listen to it that you want more. Anyway, so I don't want to take up any more time. So what we're going to do is introduce different panelists. And the first one we're going to have today is Chris Mara. Many of you may not be familiar with Chris, but Chris is the owner of Nashville's Welcome to 1979 recording studio. He's the owner of Mara Machines, which is the largest analog tape machine restoration company in the world. And he's going to talk a little bit. Hopefully, you'll have some things to talk about as far as machines. His passion for recording led him to found the analog-centric Welcome to 1979 studios. He's had clients such as Pete Townsend, Eric Burden, and Third Man Records. They're also heavily involved in the vinyl industry, and he's doing his own mastering there. And if I remember from your website, you just are the first people to get a whole new electroplating machines in the world. So they, again, they're really getting heavily into releasing vinyl. And he specializes in restoring MCI machines that are basically in use all over the world. So again, without further ado, let's welcome Chris to the podium, talk about tape. Thank you, Miles, for that wonderful introduction. Thanks. I always say my job is easy without cables and wires and stuff. Yeah, we were talking with uh, Chad and I had a nice conversation the other day about tape machines and misconceptions around tape machines. Um, and I deal with it daily with the machines I restore and sell is people think they're very complicated and require maintenance every day and on and on and on and on. And, and this comes from the internet. Uh, there's a lot of forums that talk about that. And I'm not, I'm not sure why people talk about tape machines like that. Um, I'd say 95% of the people that buy restored tape machines from me to use in recording studios have never used a machine before. And I meet people on a regular basis that, that have had a machine from me for a couple of years and I don't know who they are. And what that means is they've never had to call me or email me to figure it out. Um, so I just have a quick little slideshow to tell you, to show you how easy they are. This is one of my machines. It's the uh, a two track quarter inch, comes in half inch. That's the bigger chassis. There's also a smaller size chassis, but still, you know, uh, definitely not a desktop. Uh, it looks a little, um, um, what am I trying to say? It looks a little scary, but I shot that photo so it looked impressive. It's really easy to use. So, how many people here have not used a tape machine before? Who, who here? Okay. You, sir, in the blue right there, or somebody, somebody else right there. How do you think we would get this machine to play a tape? What, what button do you think we would hit? Right. So, okay, that's correct. You've passed. So now, if you wanted to stop it from doing that, what button would you hit? Probably stop. Yeah, it's really that simple. And fast forward, rewind. Boom. That's it. It's that easy. Um, so I'll show you how to thread a machine. This is me in that nice shirt. That's really all you have to do to put tape on a machine. Of course, I've done it a couple times, but. And then another thing our company offers is Skype or FaceTime support. So if you do happen to have a question or a comment or should something go wrong, we just uh, Skype with you and walk you through it. And, and I view it as learning as you need to learn. If you want to learn something, you can have self-discovery and muck it up and then call us and we'll straighten it out. And then now you learn. And the beautiful thing about Skype support is you have to 
do it yourself and we guide you so you are learning how to calibrate it if you want to calibrate it or adjust the tensions if you want to adjust the tensions. But it comes out of the crate ready to use and they sound wonderful. And I have just one last thing. So, and you'll never get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be calling you saying, hey, guess what? There's Mara V.2 now, and it's only $6,000 more dollars, and blah, blah, blah. So once you buy it, you're done. As long as you got uh, AC coming out of your wall and something to play it through, you're done. So that's all I have. Um, are we take? Thank you, Chris. Okay, cool. You're welcome. Thank you. OK, so the next person that I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing is Dan Labry from ATR Magnetics. And hang on one second without my glasses. I am blind. Okay, so Dan is a Canadian who's now living in the US and he's an analog recording expert who is fascinated with the intersection of music and science. And he's worked in a studio in Detroit and after leaving there he joined ATR Services and worked with the renowned Mike Spitz who's Fortunately, no, no longer with us, but he certainly was one of the greatest resources that people in the tape area have had. And Dan currently leads both technical branches of the ATR group, the Magnetics and the ATR Services. And I think you guys are one of now maybe three that are making tape in, in the world? Yeah, yeah. The studio quality tape. Yeah. yeah. And so again, ATR Services was founded in 1991 and they provide parts, repair services and restorations for the Ampex ATR 100 series tape recorders. And um, in fact, if you go upstairs to Jeff Joseph's room today, I don't know how many you've gotten there yet, it's early on, it's only Friday, you'll see one of the ATR 102 set up there with tape that you can hear. So without further ado, let me introduce Dan to everyone. Thank you, Dan. All right, so I guess it's just um, to continue with some of the things that Chris was, say, was saying. Um, but to add on to Miles' introduction, uh, so I began working with uh, Mike Spitz at ATR Service and ATR Magnetics in 2010. Um, at that point, uh, he was 20 years into restoring the ATR 100 series machines and about five years into the magnetic tape production. Uh, both companies are headquartered in York, Pennsylvania, so South Central PA. Um, Immediately, you know, coming up under his wing, he had me doing everything from uh, chemical mixing and calendaring in a tape facility to tearing down ATRs and um, answering customer emails. Um, so I think uh, what I'd like to say about uh, new tape ownership or um, what we're going to do moving forward with these machines is, I guess, similar to how Chris provides support for his clients. Um, we have a similar approach where it's all about the, the user experience. So if um, for the machine side of our work, um, we offer essentially lifetime technical support. So that can be in quotations, but if you call or email, we'll, we'll be there to help you with whatever problem you may have. Um, and the same is true with the, uh, with the tape production. If, um, whether you're a studio or a home recordist or uh, calling about and you're archiving tape made by some manufacturer 30 years ago and you just have questions about the medium, we're here to try and help you through your problems. Um, let's see. So similar to what Chris does with his tape camps and vinyl camps down in Nashville, we also offer uh, full day seminars and so we go over the tape production process. We get very in depth into uh, each stage of the manufacturing so that we can fully understand the medium, the physical medium that is the tape. Um, and then we uh, spend the remainder of the day going over uh, the calibration procedure, the magnetic recording process, um, everything related to that so that we can bring the user into you know, a higher degree of comfort when using the machine. What else I'd like to cover? Um, I look forward to answering specific questions. Um, but again, I think, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, there are, there's, for as, um, let's see, for as experienced as this medium is, there is a lot of misinformation online. 
And I think it's up to the gentleman on this panel and myself to, to, to proceed with just getting the proper information out to people and new users um, to sort of take away any apprehension towards using the, the tape in the machines. Again, I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. As, they, as both of our panels said, it's really a lot more, seems a lot more daunting than it is, especially, you know, if you get a machine that's basically a turnkey approach, like they are offering. I think um, Chris and I were talking, and he's even thinking about down the road later this year, offering is an M MCI machine mm -hmm. that'll be made for audiophiles. So again, you know, just like he said, it's really plug and play. The real effort comes into, you know, if you want to try and convert, like I've done a prosumer machine and change the heads, and it's that that's going to take a lot more work, and you know, you're going to need somebody, but that's not a necessary thing to really get into it. And I know, like, a lot of people really don't want to mess around with that. So, you know, these guys really have great approaches, and you know, these machines have been around. You, you know, they're come to you, they're warranty, just like any other audio product you have. They're offering services, so, you know, what more can you really want from them, you know? They could, people probably have more problems with their turntables than they ever have with a tape deck. You don't break, you know, you worry about, you know, snapping your cantilever off, you know, with the tape deck. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is going to be Paul Stubblebine. And kind of giving an introduction to Paul, who I could take pretty much the whole hour because given his background, but just a little short synopsis of Paul's many years. And, you know, Paul's one of these people that you may or may not know because he's a behind the scenes guy. And a lot of the stuff that you listen to, whether it be an LP, high res digital, digital, Paul's mastered tons of stuff. So, you know, a lot of the work that you listen to may not be aware, Paul's done. So Paul originally started as a staff engineer at Columbia Records in, in San Francisco, and the facility was bought by successful producer David Rubinson and became known as the Audiomat. And Paul was the mastering engineer there until it closed in 1984. In his 11 years in that building, he worked on records such as from The Grateful Dead, New Riders of the Purple Sage, and people my age will remember that group, maybe younger people don't. Um, Ry Cooter, Dominic Argento, John Lee Hooker, and Van Morrison, among others. And you know, I know some of that has come into play with a tape project, because Paul's worked with all these tapes, and he really, when these guys are hunting which titles they're going to release, Paul's got this world of knowledge, like, hey, I know that tape, I worked on that tape, so they, you know, really get the best music for their uh, tape project. He's also worked for other major labels, independent labels, and many audiophile labels, and Paul's worked with reference recording, mobile fidelity, acoustic sounds, first impression music, and others. And in 2006, Dan, Mike, and Paul founded the Tape Project, which was a label releasing music on high-quality reel-to-reel tapes, and they have a website you can go to to find out more about the Tape Project, very simple, tapeproject.com, and you can see what the titles are, if you have questions about the tapes, I mean, anything you could think of, either Dan or Paul are usually there online at some time or another, or other people that are really into tape that will help you, you know, same thing, guide you through any questions you might have. So again, let me introduce Paul Subblebine to everyone. Thanks. I'm going to keep my remarks brief uh, to leave uh, room for questions at the end also. But first, I want to echo what we've heard from uh, Chris and from Dan also. Uh, there's nothing scary about uh, having a tape machine in your living room. Uh, the machines we use were built to withstand 18 hour a day use. Uh, I get to use mine maybe 10 hours a week if I'm lucky and home listening. It'll last forever. And if you buy one from uh, either Chris's company or, or Dan's company, it arrives probably in better shape than it left the factory originally. So, uh, and operating one is not difficult. Uh, maintaining it is not a, a scary proposition. You have to clean the heads every once in a while. It's a Q-tip and a little isopropyl alcohol. Swoop, swoop, you're done. Um, I've been a recording engineer and mastering engineer for a long time and uh, started in the LP era. We, uh, we recorded on tape because that's how you made a record. And if it was coming out, it got mastered to an LP. There just was no two ways about it. And uh, no one thought about it. It was just the best we had. Um, and after that, I got involved in uh, the digital world and, and uh, 
high-res digital, working with many people uh, that were trying to push digital to sound better all the time, both PCM and DSD. And uh, it's, it's been a very interesting uh, road, but I kept having experiences that reminded me how good tape can sound itself, how satisfying uh, music on tape can be. Uh, although I don't believe it's a perfect format, I've never said so, and I don't think you'll ever hear me say that it's perfect. At the end of the day, when I want to listen to music at home, if I have it on tape, that's the way I want to hear it. It's just the most nourishing and um, has the greatest ability to let me surrender myself and let the music cast its spell on me more than any other format. In my living room, other people may experience it differently, but, but that's the way it is for me. And I had a few experiences where it was just frustrating. We're putting so much effort into the other formats, uh, although they have many advantages and, and I don't really need to run down any other formats, but it still kept coming back, kept reminding me how much I like uh, music on tape and um, after a number of uh, long evenings around the fire pit in Dan Schmally's front yard, kicking it around, we realized we had uh, uh, maybe the resources to actually put out music on tape. Uh, we knew the tape manufacturers, the machine manufacturers, the, uh, we had relationships with the record labels. Maybe we could do this. Uh, and so we tried, and here we are 10 years later. Uh, you saw the list that uh, Miles put up there about 15 outfits uh, now putting on tape and and growing because Chad is now getting into it. That's that's big news. Um, you'll see. So um, that's really all I wanted to say. That uh, the reason I'm willing to go through the extra trouble to do tape, it's extra trouble on my end as a playback format. It's not particularly troublesome, but uh, on my end to go haggle with these record labels to get rights to do this and and uh, all the various steps in the process to, to keep it as pristine as possible and to find original master tapes uh, uh, to work from. Uh, it's, it's very easy to talk to a label and they'll say yes, give us your money and then you go to pick up the tape and you find out they're giving you a third generation copy. Um, uh, everything we've put out has been from the original tapes, uh, uh, except one long story, but one of our titles. Uh, no one has the original tape. We just work from the best copy that exists. It's all on, the, on our web form if you want to read the sordid story. But we go to all this trouble uh, because at the end of the day, there's just something magical about uh, listening to music on tape. I'm, I'm just like the rest of you guys. I'm an audiophile. And uh, one of my greatest joys in life is to be able to, to tap into this tremendous uh, library of recorded music and, and hear it in my own living room. So that's um, why we do it. That's it. Well, just, just to follow up on some of Paul's comments, I pretty much have all of your tape releases. And I have the tape releases in other formats. And, you know, one format I just wanted to mention is, for instance, reference recordings. And we're going to talk about the earlier reference recordings when they did digital and analog and parallel. And I know everyone used to rave about the records, but personally, I thought they were pretty much ho-hum. I really didn't like the sound of them. And all of a sudden, then Keith and Paul worked together, and Keith brought his magical tape machine, which is kind of one of, the, one of those one-of-a-kind tape machines and to Paul's and they transferred the tapes. And I tell you, if you really want to hear like the Arnold Overtures recording, the Nojima, I think it was Nojima Plays List, if you want to hear any of the other four titles that the tape project is done from reference recording, even if you don't own it, try and get a listen to someone who has it. But I'm going to tell you, it's the only way that you're really going to hear the, the wonderments that Keith Johnson does. I mean, he's really a brilliant person, but that, those tapes, the originals really show it off. Anyway, what I, next last person on the panel I'd like to introduce is Chad Kassam of Acoustic Sounds, and he hardly needs an introduction because I think everyone in the world knows Chad. Um, I do have one slightly funny story about Chad, and he may or may not remember, but Chad started out 
pretty much selling used records. And I only found out recently, do you remember a store up in Mamaroneck, New York, run by Rudy, Definitive Audio? And I always wondered, because we used to have a Friday night get together every week, all the audiophiles, Michael Gindy, myself, Tom Gillette, Roy Hall, a lot of people used to always get up there together on a Friday night and listen. And there were all these records on the wall. And I never knew whose records they were. And it, Rudy had disappeared off the face of the earth. I started my audio form, and who magically pops up in my audio form after like 20 years is Rudy. And it's like, Rudy, who, was, who were those records from? He's like, those were Chad's records. Like, I never knew those were Chad's records. Anyway, any, what I'd like to introduce, who, I'd like to introduce Chad next. Chad's got a really exciting announcement to make about his getting into real to real tapes. I mean, there are a lot of us who've been hounding Chad over the years. Chad, you really need to do it. You really need to do it. And we'd always get a very polite response from Chad. Yeah, sure, buddy. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. And, you know, it's nice to see that he's really now joined the group of releasing tapes. And, you know, one of the things, and I said this to Chad when he told me he was going to do it, I said, you know, one thing I've always said is that, you know, it was great, Paul and everybody started it, but the person who's got the access to so many, so many different types of music, you know, and one of the things is the software. When tapes started, there was lots of hardware out there. And remember, we're not talking about the seven and a half IPS tapes that your parents had, you know, that were duplicated God knows in what speed. I mean, these are like 15 IPS real-time duplicated. So again, there's really no rushing the process. Like you can't watch water and make it boil. Well, you can't, you know, watch these tapes and make them come off any faster off the machines. It did really, it's, takes a lot of time, someone's got to sit there, switch back and forth and listen to them, make sure that the tapes are good and things like that. So, you know, when they start doing real-time tapes, it's really a whole different world than what anyone is really used to. So I always said, like, you know, the person that could really, we really want, you know, and I hear this because I talk to a lot of people who are thinking about tapes, we want rock. Let's look at the rest of the world, this is 60% of the music is rock music. You know, if we really want to get inroads, we got to have rock on tape. And that's why I think it's so important that Chad's really joined the crowd now because he's got the access to these tapes. They're really now, a lot of people, I'm hoping that not only audiophiles who are sitting on the fence thinking about getting into tape, but even people now who could, you know, refurbish machines. Like, hey, there's a real movement. Chad, you know, Chad's doing this, it catches their eye. So, you know, again, what I'd like to introduce is Chad, who's going to talk about his getting into tape and what he's going to be doing. Chad? Hello. Um, yeah, it's just we we thought we should have a panel just to try to let everybody know that uh, what what's going to be coming because you know everybody. I mean, we're into the everybody that's here and at this show is here because they're into the ultimate audio. You know, the experience. I mean, they're spend whatever it takes to get you know a new amplifier, a new turntable, or whatever to have the the finest audio in their house and. Um, there's nothing they can really, or y'all can really do to upgrade y'all's system more than the source and the source being analog tape. I mean, you can't get closer to the source than that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny how, you know, a lot of our customers, you know, they'll spend 100000 on an amp or they'll do this, that, or the other. And, you know, nothing against the amp they bought. I'm sure it made a difference. Uh, I mean, hopefully you can hear the difference. But, you know, if they bought a tape machine and they got a good, you know, copy of a, a good recording, I mean, the difference is just so much greater than anything they could do to upgrade their system. Again, I'm not, we're at an audio show and, um, you know, amps, different amps sound different or better and, and things like that, but there's nothing they can do. I don't care um, what you do that you can make a, a, as big an improvement as to go straight to, to analog tape. And uh, I mean, if you don't believe me, go to uh, Jeff Rowland's room or Jeff Joseph's room, uh, 532, and hear some of Paul's tapes or some of our tapes. But we... Um, you know we're we're into to making records and 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 that's uh, gets you very close to the source with the 45 RPMs and this and that, but again the the tape is is uh, just one one level closer and and the reason that all of this is happening is because because of y'all you know I mean basically 
you know, for tape to come back like it has um, is, is just incredible. And, uh, you know, people are going buying really expensive machines. Everybody's doing this without any software, you know what I mean? It's just crazy that people would buy so many machines and, and, and expensive machines without really not much to play. I mean, they were really uh, counting on people stepping up and, and, and I say, uh, you know, they bought the, the car and now, now we're here to get, give the gasoline, sell the gasoline to y'all so you can run the car. But man, it's impressive how many people bought so many tape machines without much, you know, without the fuel to run them. But um, it's all working out. It all got to work together, you know, and it's just got to work together. They got to have the, the tape and they have to have people that make the tape uh, without that, which I mean, at one time, um, I think ATR was the only people making tape. So, I mean, that was pretty scary uh, and it could happen again. So, um, you know, they have to have the tape, they have to have the titles, the music, and then they have to have the machines. And, um, and so we're just want to, uh, get involved it's because everybody i mean you know miles and, and dave robinson and everybody just hey when are you going to do some tape when are you going to do some tape i mean even paul even though he's doing it he's like hey man we need you to to come and, and release some titles also to you know to keep this thing going and and uh, and it, you know so nobody it's no not competitive at all i mean the more the merrier the more that this come more tapes that come out the better it is be for everyone, the consumer, the other dealers that sell it, and the people that sell tape machines. So uh, we're all, we're going to try to get y'all as many tapes as we can. It's very, very difficult to negotiate with the, the, uh, the major labels on this because it's such an odd thing. It's like, uh, we're going to reissue, we want to reissue these tapes. Uh, real to real, yeah, right. You know, they they just they just can't even believe it. You know, they they it's so strange to them that they don't they just don't want to do it. You know, and then when you tell them what they sell for, they they just don't believe that either. You know, so it's a lot harder than than anybody would ever imagine to to get these. I mean, even you can walk up with. A, a pile of cash in your hand and say, look, you know, here, here it's yours. It, it's um, so much paperwork involved. But, but anyway, we're just here to say that, you know, we appreciate the support and we, we, people are begging for it. It's coming. It's going to take a while. Um, the, the one thing is we, we just got a, a record pressing plant and we're manufacturing records. And, you, you know, it's very, very difficult. It's very, very... Um, labor intensive, but man, making tape compared to making records, I mean, if you think making records is hard, which is like the hardest thing there is in the, the world to do, and it's time consuming, and it's just, but at least you can, one machine can make 750 records a day, you know? To make tape, I mean, one-off, real-time tape, it's like, it, it just makes making records like, it's just so much, yeah, it, it's, it's hard, but um, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna do it well, and uh, you know, everybody's working together, and we got, you know, the two, uh, the two professional tape machine makers are here that service the recording industry. Like all the, all the major studios use the ATR to record. Uh, so it's like, and, and a lot use the MCI as well, and at our studio I have both. And uh, Doug Sachs also had the MCI machine. So, you know, they're, they're the, from the, the, the pros use those two brands. But uh, I'd just like to, like, how much of y'all's business changed from pros to consumers? I mean, is it about... From from a hundred percent to what? I'll just for ATR. Uh, maybe new machine sales. I, I don't know if this is on. New machine sales 
25% go to recording studios, 75% going to home listening and high fidelity. Right, but like three years ago, four years ago, what was that? Oh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It, over the past four or five years, it's just been more, more machines prepared. Right, but I mean, a good guess. I mean, five years ago, were you selling 10% to consumers? Yeah, yeah, right, right. So 10, 90, 90, 10 now. Yeah, so it's just flopped. I mean, in, in just a few years. I mean, Chris, are you selling more to consumers? I haven't launched the the um, model yet, but I've been getting a lot more requests. And a year ago, even, it didn't even cross my mind. Right. Well, well what's happening is the the only problem with the, the pro machines. I mean, is they're a lot they're bigger, you know, and a lot of people want the smaller, and that's the only problem. But to me, it ain't a problem. I I'll, I'll just move things around in the house. We, we're going to have the best, you know. I mean, we... Yeah, I mean, we all drive know. SUVs. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll lose a few pieces of furniture for it. But um, anyway, we're just, I want to say thanks. Thank everybody for the support and the encouragement. I mean, it's just like people to just encourage you to, to get in the, the high-res download business, you know, and it's just relentless, you know, every time you answer the phone they're like well when are you going to do the high res you know and now when are you going to you know get in the record pressing business well now it's like well, when are you going to get into the to the tape business and it's just since my job is to do what my customers ask for and I and what my customers want is the ultimate sound I mean they want to get as close to to hearing you know Elvis as they can you know and or, or whatever, you know, and uh, and that's our job to pick the titles and to bring it on a format, and and uh, that's what we're here for. And it's just, it's really amazing how many people are getting into it. And uh, I think it just began. So, thanks. Thanks, Chad. Well, I think Chad's in a little unique situation, but you don't you own like half of Kansas? <laughs> but um, thank you, everyone. You know, I just want to just add a little footnote to maybe, you know, the how would you go about in terms of using a prosumer machine if you wanted to go like a Techniques or an Otari machine. And again, those are, you know, really good machines to, you know, to choose from. They generally have good transports, but, you know, you're dealing with 1970s type solid state electronics. And the, the other issue that you'll find with those machines is more that you're going to need to get a machine that, or convert it so it can play IEC equalization, okay? But you got two basic curves. There is another one we could talk about, but basically you need to be concerned with either NAB or IEC. And all the new tapes today are coming out in IEC. Most of the older machines were only built for NAB. So that's why a lot of people can send machines back. I know even Jeff Jacobs will modify them so you can, you know, run right off of the head and run it into outboard electronics like I do. Like Charlie King over here. Charlie, raise your hand. Like Charlie's been kind of like my tape guru and he's set up my machine and he's really knowledgeable on machines. I think one of the people who came over to my place and is buying a machine is getting it from Charlie. He's buying a Studer with Charlie's electronics inside. So again, there's lots of different roads to Rome. So again, I want to thank all the panelists. And again, let me open up the floor now. I'm sure there's some people with some questions, so raise your hands and shoot away. Gentlemen in the back. Uh, question about generational degradation. You are making new uh, masters. How many companies, uh, Chad, you have a record pressing factory? So you know that you have uh, a pristine disk, you make 750 uh, for a tape. How many times? Can you run the original tape to make copies? How do you get around that problem? That at some point, regardless of how good your machines are, you're going to run into that, that there is wear because it is a living Well, th this probably a better, they could probably answer that better. I'm sure you can make many, many good tapes off of, off of, uh, I mean, it definitely is going to be some wear. You know, the the question is, you know, how much wear, and uh, but I mean, Paul is a mastering engineer. He's 
deals with tape that you probably have to bake, and then Dan, they, <laughs> they make tape. And uh, so it's probably better. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that the, uh, the number of passes we use a tape in making dupes uh, for our customers, we make three dupes at once, by the way. So do several hundred copies. We've run the, the uh, master maybe 100 times, our running master, not the original master. I think that wear at that level is uh, a non-issue, and I think for the uh, customer who buys one of these tapes and enjoys it many times, we hope, we've chosen music they'll want to listen to again and again, nowhere near a problem, nowhere near a problem. There have been instances in the recording process back in the 70s when people were uh, recording on multi-track tape that uh, certain bands would spend a year making a record, and they would, in fact, uh, run enough passes to notice a degradation. But in, in the world we're in, it's a non-issue. There is an issue sometimes with tape itself degrading. Some of the master tapes we get to work from clearly have lost a little spark. Uh, some of the others have not. And curiously, the older they are, the more likely they are to retain the spark. There was a dip in the 70s in the formulations we had uh, but that's a separate issue. Uh, I think um, a person thinking about getting into tape for the home literally does not have to worry about the number of passes these tapes uh, have gone through. Hey, Paul, you brought a show and tell, so why don't you do your show and tell while you're... Uh, all right. Uh, I didn't bring slides. I brought two artifacts. One is just uh, a, a packaged album, like what we sell our customers in case no one's ever seen it. <laughs> for us, an album is two reels, so that's and mostly we sell quarter inch, although customers can buy half inch versions. So a couple of reels in, a bo in boxes and album art almost as big as the LP. So that's what uh, an album looks like when a UPS man brings it to your door. The other thing I brought, my partner Dan Schmalley's company, Bottlehead, makes a couple of repro electronics, one in kit form and one in ready-made form. Uh, and uh, I use them both uh, all the time. And I just brought one of them. This is the ready-made version of it. It's, uh, it's about a $4,000 product as both uh, um, unbalanced and balanced outs. If you're in a position where you have to drive your cables 100 feet, this will do it on the balanced out. Uh, but if your machine is right next to your preamp, you can take the unbalanced out. Um, and uh, this, this is made f to go with any machine that you want to uh, convert to bring the head cables out to the externally, uh, which I've done to my ATR at, at home in my uh, living room. And I've done to my Technics 1500, which I have at my uh, summer place near Yosemite. Um, so uh, that's what it is. Anyone wants to look uh, closer? At the end, come on down, we'll have these here. And, you know, you may take that for granted, but they kind of set the standard for everyone else to meet in terms of the packaging. I mean, you know, they looked at it, and it wasn't just the quality, but everything had to kind of fit everything. And, you know, a lot of the companies out there just kind of put the tape in a white box, and maybe yeah. they enclose something as a afterthought to tell you, like, what you're listening to. Uh, except for a couple of the new Italian companies, and we all know how Italians are. Yes. And the tapes that I've been Italian getting design. from Italy, the packaging yeah. is like, blows me away. I mean, they're having special packaging and hard plastic cases, and it's pretty amazing what they're doing. So again, you know, but these guys have really caused everybody to step their game up, no matter, you know, who's releasing tape. And now if we're charging, you know, $350, $400 for tape, I mean, you know, you have to have something more than in a white box. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, we thought so. When we started out, we knew we were uh, going uphill w with this, putting out an album at four times the price of the most expensive multi-LP 45 RPM set. And we, we wanted people to feel when they picked it up that it had value. And so we went to a lot of extra trouble. We made uh, custom dies for the, our unique flange. We searched around to find a... Uh, company that could make these nice boxes at a price we can afford. Um, now, in the end, it's not costing us much more than routine packaging, but we felt it was worth it. We had to go through all this extra work in the beginning so that we would 
have something when we place it in the customer's hand, they would be impressed. They you know, and, the, uh, and I just want to immediately wanted, feel that there was care behind it. And one other thing is, I know people are kind of like, you can maybe hear a gasp when you might say, well, the tape is $350 or something. But, you know, let me add something. You know, you look at some of the tapes that the tape project has done, um, some of the blue notes that they've reissued, and you look at what an original blue note reissue is going for now. I mean, some of them are scary. I like see th them going for, first of all, you don't even know what shape they're in. I mean, you know, God knows what shape they're in. And they're going like on eBay for $3,200. And I look at that and go, do you play it or do you frame it and put it on the wall? <laughs> you know, it, so, you know, when you look at, hey, you're getting something that's right off the master and you know it's great as opposed to something you're buying off eBay, which is a crapshoot. I mean, which are you going to go for? I mean, to me, the, the answer is pretty obvious. Okay, any other questions? The extended response heads. Yeah, that's Luxia. Sure. Uh, so, uh, okay, so there are plenty of things to confuse when it comes to track formats and tape, uh, you know, tape widths, that sort of thing. But um, before I go too deep, I just want to say establishing a relationship with a, a technician for a specific machine or reel-to-reel uh, -reel sort of general purpose is always a great step for moving forward with your deck. Um, extended response heads, for example. So uh, because of the physical nature of the, uh, the playback process, we have a natural emphasis in the low frequency. So, um, for example, at 15 ips, uh, 60 hertz is emphasized because of the geometry of the head and the recorded wavelength. So, with and then so we're assuming a standard geometry of the head. What the extended response head allows for, um, it's a broadening of the face of the head, changing the geometry of that head allowing for when you uh, increase the 30 inches per second, allowing for increased top end output, you're shifting the low frequency emphases down one octave to broaden the full spectrum. So the term extended response is really referring to the 30 ips application mm -hmm. to really broaden it with a sort of a 15 ips low end and a 30 ips uh, top end. I wanted, we've got like one or two more minutes, but I just want to add one question to the panel, because you guys have a lot of experience with it, and I've heard very differing opinions, but in coming and working with these master tapes, you hear some people saying, hey, you should go back to the original heads, the head block that was used with the recording to get the most out of it, or do you feel just like having a good optimized geometry in the heads is, is sufficient to redo and reissue oh, yeah. the tapes? The machines now are, like that I restore, are better than the tape set we use to transfer. Because with Studio Island, we do a lot of transfers uh, of older materials from the 60s and 50s and 70s. And you know, it's a better machine now than then, especially in terms of constant speed and tension across tape path, pack, that kind of thing. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think their heads are better now, too. And the whole machine is better. Yeah. I just want to make a point in case uh, we all know this and we've forgotten to tell you. Um, <laughs> tape machine. Uh, is, consists of a transport, the heads, and the electronics. They're all important to the sound. The transport is about half. Uh, remember what we learned 25 years ago with the LP playback, the quality of the turntable actually matters. Well, tape is an electromechanical, uh, electromagnetic mechanical uh, format as well, and the mechanic part really, really matters. Um, and uh, where the game is played is pulling the tape across the heads, that uh, steadiness of the, uh, of the speed and uh, lack of disturbances, tremendously important. Um, but the heads and the electronics uh, uh, make a big difference too. And the uh, uh, electronics that we have available, this is just one option, Charlie makes one and there's several others, uh, in my opinion, uh, outdo the uh, electronics that came with our machines, even from the legendary companies, Ampex and Studer and so forth. We have 
the ability to improve on them with the uh, electronics and the heads uh, you mentioned from JRF, the extended response head that's made by Flux Magnetics, they're making fabulous heads. They're and the, the biggest point is that there are heads available. Because that's had. most people's comments. Like, what am right. I going to do? The heads are worn out, whatever. It's like, that's not a problem anymore yeah. because there are heads out there. That was the weak point, right? Yeah. Yep. And I should say, uh, since I do know a good bit about vinyl, because we, we cut vinyl masters at my studio, and not to, not to put one format down over another, but if we're talking about facts, there's no uh, diameter loss on analog tape. The first song sounds exactly the same as the last song. And that's just physics. That, that isn't possible on a record. Um, so if, if you're talking about fidelity, then that's, that's a huge point. So. Well, I want to thank everyone. We need to wrap up. Thank everyone for coming. And we want to thank this wonderful panel.